Welcome to the Probate Nation television show. We continue our discussion about how to probate an estate of a loved one. A Virginia probate is a process to transfer the title or ownership of probate assets to the beneficiaries of a deceased person. Not all assets are probate assets, and there are different types of probate, some simple, others more complicated. Like a journey on a slow-moving steam engine train, probate of an estate has a beginning, several stops along the way, and at the end of the trip, the balance of probate assets remaining are delivered to the decedent's beneficiaries. Some probate train rides are short, while other probates seem to never end. Our program today takes up a discussion about two types of claims that arise from time to time that the personal representative will need to evaluate and, if merited, pursue with litigation. I'm talking about personal injury to the decedent that arose prior to the decedent's death and did not cause his death. And I'm also talking about wrongful death claims that arise because they cause the death of the decedent. Both are claims the estate may pursue, but as we will learn, while the benefits of each claim may be very different, many of the steps you will need to take are similar. This program will address these two different claims and provide insight and guidance as to what to do and when so that you properly lodge your claim and set the wheels in motion to pursue it. Peter DePaulis is a partner in the Metro DC law firm of Coons, McKinney, Johnson, DePaulis, and Lightfoot, LLP, where he has handled numerous asbestos disease cases, as well as cases involving serious injuries arising from auto accidents, construction accident cases, and medical malpractice. Prior to joining his law firm in 1980, he clerked for a DC Superior Court judge and then served as an assistant U.S. attorney in DC from 1977 to 1980. Peter has been a member of the Fairfax Bar Association since 1985 and served as its president from 2001 to 2002. Also joining us is Jack Burgess, who is the founding partner of the Fairfax Law Firm of Burgess and Paragard, PLLC, in Fairfax, Virginia, where he limits his practice to personal injury, wrongful death, medical malpractice, workman's compensation, defective products, premises liability, and police and fire law. Jack has authored, authored articles and books, including Personal Injury Litigation Practice in Virginia and Evidence and Trial Practice in Virginia. He is also a member of the Virginia Trial Lawyers Association, the D.C. Trial Lawyers Association, and the American Association of Justice. Please join me in welcoming attorneys Peter DePaulis and Jack Burgess. Guys, thanks very much for coming on the program today. <clears throat> you are. a pleasure. You know, did, let's start with an overview, Peter. Sure. You know, tell us what is the difference between a wrongful death claim, as I described in the beginning, and a personal injury claim in the context of an estate. Sure. Let me start off by telling you how they are in part the same. They're both premised upon a concept called negligence, which means the other party is the sole cause of the event that led to the death or the injury. So negligence is the common denominator between the two types of cases. A wrongful death case is what its name seems to connote, a death brought on by the acts of someone else. A personal injury case is an injury short of death also brought on by the acts of someone else. The damages that are available to an injured party are different from the damages available to the family of somebody who was killed, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. But conceptually, they're, they're similar in, in terms of both needing negligence of someone else and also the damages all stem from the injury or the loss to the family. Okay, so let's give, let's <clears throat> give a couple of examples. Sure. So what is an example of a wrongful death claim that an estate might sue on? Sure, you can take a fairly straight, uh, straightforward auto accident that unfortunately leads to the death of someone who was not the cause of the accident. So you'll have what is typically a personal injury type case that turns into a wrongful death case because somebody died as a result of someone else's negligence. So an automobile accident claim can be personal injury for someone who was hurt and survives, or wrongful death, someone who was killed as a result of the wrongful act. So then the, the example of the <clears throat> personal injury claim is in fact that auto accident case mm -hmm. that doesn't cause a person's death. Right. But then they die a couple years later that case continues on as a personal injury case. Right, it has an odd name, it's called a survival action. Survival action. Uh, it has nothing to do with the, the, the person who died because that person did not survive, but the action survives the person's death. 
So if someone's hurt in a car accident and then dies of cancer a couple of years later, his or her family can bring the personal injury action, now called a survival action, just as though that person were alive. But you have to make that distinction between a death that's related to the action versus a death that's not related to the action. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Jack, uh, we, we have we, these, these two types of actions that can, take, can be uh, taken by an estate. Describe for me the normal terms for engaging an attorney to represent you know, and pursue these claims either on behalf of the state or on behalf of the beneficiaries of the estate, depending upon what kind of action it is. Well, from the plaintiff's perspective, Richard, and that would be the injured person, the injured person's uh, family, uh, be it a survival action or a wrongful death case, the administrator or executor of the estate, the typical arrangement that is entered into is a contingent fee arrangement whereby mm -hmm. the plaintiff's lawyer's uh, fee is based upon a percentage of the recovery. And that is contrasted with the defense perspective in these cases. Uh, typically, if you're dealing with a motor vehicle accident, a trucking company, a medical negligence case, the defendant is either going to have a large liability insurance policy or they're going to be self-insured so that the billable hours of the defense attorney are going to be paid by uh, a deep pocket somewhere. Uh, from the plaintiff's perspective, the injury or the death may have put the injured party or the family, the surviving family, in a very difficult financial situation whereby mm -hmm. they can't come up with the hourly rate to retain counsel. So our firms typically handle those cases on a contingent fee basis whereby uh, we only charge a fee if we're successful in making a recovery at the end of the day. And that, that, that's a very good, that's a, that's a common practice. It is. It is. Um, well, as we, we've identified some claims, but the big thing we have to do next, of course, is to investigate these. And so, Jack, talk, tell us a little bit about the type of information that needs to be gathered to evaluate the merits of these cases. Well, there's a tremendous amount of information out there when something bad happens, and the plaintiffs are typically in the worst position to develop their case. They're dealing with a serious injury or perhaps a death, and they're bigger fish to fry that day than investigating the accident. Uh, again, I'll contrast the defense perspective. If you're dealing with a trucking company or a big insurance company, they've got investigators out working those cases promptly. So most important, whether you're dealing with a motor vehicle case, a defective product case, a medical negligence case or a death case where perhaps an autopsy needs to be performed, prompt investigation is very important. And then depending on the type of the case, be it motor vehicle, defective product, uh, medical negligence, or some other form of uh, incident causing death, uh, the, the case is going to follow the proper investigative route depending on the facts of the case. It might be finding witnesses to a car crash. It might be finding who was in the operating room and who saw what when a medical event occurred. Mm -hmm. It might be as simple in a defective product case as number one rule in those cases is always get the product. Okay. Um, so, um, so again, you've kind of touched on a little bit, Jack, but Peter, why don't you continue with the sure. thought process about some of the actions <clears throat> that need to be taken and when to help with this evaluation process and preserve the right to make a claim. Sure. Jack began to touch <clears throat> upon that. As Jack mentioned, taking actions quickly uh, are, are ex extremely important and very difficult because the family has just gone through a catastrophic event that uh, caused someone's death or serious injury. But um, when we are contacted by families in that circumstance, we try to be the calm voice on the phone that gives them a map for them to follow as they're going through a very difficult time. That could be a some, something as simple as sending an investigator out to a scene to photograph the road conditions. Could be as complicated as setting up a private autopsy. Sometimes the cause of death could be a matter of controversy, and you have to actually take the, uh, the extraordinary steps of setting up a private autopsy. And equally important, eventually an estate has to be opened so that there is a spokesperson for that estate who has the legal authority to sign releases and get records and things of that nature. But preserving evidence 
which uh, could also be 911 tapes. It could be uh, police investigative notes. Um, are critically important, particularly in premises liability cases where you may have to reach out to the premises owner within 10 days of an event and ask him or her to preserve the videotape, uh, which can be very, very important later on. So acting quickly at a very difficult time in someone's life is really the key to having a good, thorough investigation. Okay. Now, Jack, is there, is there a time period in which people have to act in order to pursue these types of claims? There is a statute of limitation that applies to every claim, be it a, a personal injury case, a wrongful death case, a medical negligence case, a defective product case. Uh, there are exceptions when you go from state to state. In D.C., there's a three-year personal injury statute of limitations and a one-year wrongful death statute of mm. limitations. Maryland has its own set of rules. And there are exceptions to all of those rules. In some products liability case, the statute of lim limitations will be told for many years until there's a, a, an event which occurs that uh, starts the statute of limitations to run. In a case involving a minor, uh, typically unless it's a medical malpractice case which has its own set of rules, mm -hmm. the minor statute of limitations is not going to begin to run until their 18th birthday. So yes, there are rules. Uh, there are statute limitations that once you get beyond it, you can never bring the case. But I believe Peter would agree that uh, a very important thing to do is not be governed by the statute of limitations and say, I need to find a lawyer before the statute runs. You need to do something before then because much has happened since the event until the running of the statute of limitations. And investigation, prompt investigation, is very, very important. Okay. Uh, Peter, what are some of the common mistakes? You know, we've, we're hearing a lot of things that we need to do. We've got to be active. We have to be proactive. Mm -hmm. um, but we're in a difficult situation. But what are the common mistakes that you see personal representatives making in this situation? I, I think a lot of personal representatives misunderstand the role of their lawyer at this time. The lawyer is trying to determine whether or not there's a meritorious case. Hiring a lawyer to investigate a case doesn't necessarily mean that there is a case, but you're going to do your baseline investigation so that you can make a good business judgment later on. The biggest mistake that personal representatives make is worrying at the beginning of who the beneficiaries may be a year or two down the road. That's a problem that will resolve itself over time, but it shouldn't fog anybody's judgment as to the need to go forward with an investigation within that statute, statute of limitations. And recently we had an occasion to set up a private autopsy for a family who lost a loved one in a mishap. We only had a window of time of 48 hours to get that done. That, uh, there was no personal representative yet, but the family moved very quickly to get that process going. And by um, being named the proper type of personal rep, as you know, it's very, very tricky. You have to get it done correctly. Otherwise, later on down the road, you could have a procedural problem. Okay. Um, so I guess I want to pick up on one final thought here, Peter. You know, if sometimes um, clients have unrealistic expectations mm -hmm. about the, the value of this particular claim. And how do you deal with those expectations? How do you manage those? We, we try at the beginning of our involvement in the case to not to get bogged down with discussions on value because you really don't know what a value, what the value of the case can be. You don't know how much insurance there is. You don't know whether or not there's things like liens and unpaid medical bills. So we give clients an understanding of the basic concepts of what a case is, but we try not to get bogged down into any evaluation at the beginning of the relationship because those evaluations are very misleading because you don't know how much insurance there is, you don't know what the facts are. Uh, so we try to, in a very professional way, nudge people away from that evaluation to allow us to do our investigation. We'll get back to the question of value later on. Now, Jack, leading to that value evaluation, one of the real keys, as Peter started, just barely touched on, is, is claims that could be against the estate for Medicare, medical insurance, insurance companies that paid bills and they want to be reimbursed. Tell me about some of the challenges that we have to deal, you have to deal with there. Well, the claims you're referring to are called liens, and a lien is a third party's interest in an underlying case, be it a personal injury case or survival action or a 
wrongful death case. Mm -hmm. uh, Virginia has an anti-subrogation statute, which kind of sounds like it might solve that problem. It only solves the problem in a limited number of uh, situations where you're dealing with a private Virginia insurer and a resident of Virginia who is having their medical bills paid through that insurer. In that case, Virginia's anti-subrogation statute prevents the health insurer, if that's the entity we're talking about, from asserting a lien. Uh -huh. However, uh, that's not the case in many cases, and it's not the case when you live in a metropolitan area such as the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Uh, many Virginia residents are employees of the federal government. FEBA, the Federal Employee Health Benefit Act, provides for lien. Mm -hmm. uh, Medicare provides for liens. ERISA compliant plans provide for liens. And all of those vehicles are established under federal law, which preempts Virginia law. So we're dealing with liens in many of these cases. And even under Virginia law, be it uh, a Medicaid situation or a workers' compensation case, there's going to be a lien against the recovery that we need to uh, pay attention to because it can be quite a trap if some insurer has paid a lot of the medical bills. Uh, if you don't pay attention to the lien, it's got to be acknowledged. It's got to be determined whether it's valid or not. And if it is valid, there might be the opportunity to, nego to negotiate it down, but you can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to litigate with these folks. I uh, thought I concluded a medical malpractice case about two years ago, and I concluded it last week because Medicare had asserted a uh, lien of about $146,000 on the mm. wrongful death case that I had pursued. Uh, we disagreed. Uh, ultimately, after uh, working for two more years on that case, the Medicare lien was reduced to $4,000. But had we simply ignored it and dispersed the money, we would have created a tremendous amount of problems for the uh, family two years ago. Uh, and contrary to that, we had happy clients two weeks ago when we were finally able to disperse the settlement proceeds and pay Medicare back only about $4,000. Well, that's good. Just to add a thought to Jack's um, last remarks, um, TRICARE, which is military medicine, also asserts liens. And for a lot of folks in this area who are military, active duty, or retired, TRICARE is a huge issue in these cases, and you've got to be very careful to take care of their interests. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm going to have each of you briefly kind of touch on a couple of things here as we're going to, we're going to, this, there's so much information that we're going to run out of time. Um, Jack, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and pick up on this. In the case of a personal injury claim, if there is a recovery via judgment or settlement, you know, who gets the money? In a personal injury case or where survival the, action, as you call them. Where the injured person dies before the case is resolved and it's converted to a survival action, those funds are actually paid into the estate and the funds are dispersed according to the decedent's will or the intestacy laws of Virginia. Okay. Contrary to that, in a wrongful death case, uh, Virginia has a wrongful death statute and the whole body of law is statutory and the distribution is to statutory beneficiaries who are defined not by the testator's wishes or the intestacy laws, but by the uh, Virginia Code itself, which sets forth who gets what. So there's two different paths that you follow in those two situations. Okay. Peter, why don't you talk about the sort of contrast between personal injury cases and wrongful death cases, sure. the types of damages that are recoverable. Sure. So Jack has kind of covered both right. sides here. Let's talk about damages. What, what can you get? What In a personal recover? injury case, there's three categories of damages. There's medical bills that have already been incurred and that are going to be incurred into the future, mm -hmm. lost wages already incurred and prospectively into the future, and then quality of life, the perhaps permanent impairment, disfigurement, things of that nature. That third aspect is very personal to that case um, because it all depends the impact that an injury has had on someone's career or someone's ability to just lead their life normally. In a wrongful death claim, the focus includes something that's unique to Virginia. There's very few uh, states that allow it, and that's the grief and bereavement of the surviving family members. As Jack indicated, there's a list in the wrongful death statute of who has a right to bring a claim. 
And one of the claims that, are, uh, that can be brought is the grief and bereavement of their surviving relative. Mm. This could include adult children, it could include um, surviving spouse, um, and things of that nature. Again, that's very unique to Virginia. Uh, for instance, in the District of Columbia, no such claim can be brought. So if it is a Virginia wrongful death statute, you have not only the personal injury damages that you can bring as part of your claim, but you can bring the typical death damages, which are grief and bereavement of a, of a family member. Okay. And Jack, I'm going to come back to you now. Let's talk about, just talk to us a little bit about, we enter into either get a judgment or we enter into a settlement, whether it's wrongful death, or, or, or a survival action. Um, check for uh, $100 is to be paid. How is that, does that money go directly to somebody or does it go to the attorney first and they sort of sort out and make sure everything gets paid correctly and then dispersed? Well, contrary to a normal personal injury case, which can be settled and an insurance carrier or a defendant can write a check to the attorney and the client, uh, survival actions and wrongful death actions require court approval. Okay. Uh, and the uh, survival setting, uh, it's going to be approved and then processed through the estate and the attorney handling the estate would distribute the proceeds uh, pursuant to the decedent's wishes. If it uh, is a wrongful death case, uh, the parties are going to have to appear before the court even if the case is not in litigation for purposes of having the uh, wrongful death settlement approved and basically you make your pitch to a circuit court judge explaining the facts of the case, who the beneficiaries are, uh, what the distribution is that has been agreed to among the beneficiaries if they have reached an agreement and only then does the court enter a final order approving the compromise settlement and allowing plaintiff's counsel to disperse the settlement proceeds typically through his law firm's escrow account. So that's what I wanted to make sure I was clear about, that people would understand that what, what eventually is approved either by agreement or by court order generally makes its way through the attorney's mm -hmm. uh, uh, trust account so that we can make sure all the costs get paid and stuff like that and then there's a final division that then is, is written up and sure. the, 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 the clients have to sign off on whether it's the personal representative or the beneficiary in a survival and a survival and wrongful death action. Correct, because as we discussed earlier, uh, although one check comes in, the funds are perhaps going to go in many different ways to pay cost, fees, right. liens, multiple beneficiaries. So at the end of the day, there could be many checks written uh, from the attorney's escrow account once the funds have cleared. Okay. And we have found that families, for the most part, are relieved not to have that responsibility of making that distribution. Sometimes <coughs> there's family issues. Sometimes there's uh, people who may not get along very well. So if you have a neutral person, such as an attorney, saying this is what the law calls for, here's how the money's being divided, we've taken care of all the liens and the bills, most families find it somewhat a relief to have somebody outside the family take care of that problem. I'm sure. Um, well, fellas, this has been very, very, very informative and, of course, I think our viewers, it's important to understand the difference between a, a, a wrongful death claim and, as we talk, as I now understand more, more, more uh, fully, a survival action. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about some, get some final thoughts from each of you about, uh, you know, things that people should be aware of and some suggestions, any pitfalls that you want to share as kind of your final thoughts on this. Jack, you want to start? Certainly. Well, to summarize what I think is most important, Richard, is a very prompt and thorough investigation by an objective resource such as an experienced attorney who can uh, level the playing field for the benefit of the plaintiff's family. Uh, the defense are working on the case and uh, plaintiff needs that ability as well. And Peter? Sim simply stated, getting an attorney involved early on in the process, as Jack said, levels the playing field. They have their advocates, you need yours, and that's the way to do it through hiring an attorney promptly. Phyllis, thank you so much for coming on the show today and for taking the time. This is a great public service to our community. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, without a doubt, probate can be complicated and confusing, and as we learned in today's show, probating a state can involve more than just consolidating bank accounts, paying bills, filing tax returns, or importing all of that to the local commissioner of account. And in fact, a significant and sometimes only work of a, pep a personal representative may be to pursue a claim for damages arising from a 
personal injury slash survival action, or wrongful death claim. As our guests explain, however, identifying these claims, building the case, pursuing these claims takes time and most cases requires immediate action by the family during a stressful and emotional time as they must retain counsel and preserve evidence to help pursue the claim. Our guests today, both experienced attorneys in this field of law, have provided some valuable and practical advice on how to make this all happen and we're grateful for them for taking the time to do so. This brings us to the conclusion of our show on dealing with wrongful death claims and personal injury claims. We hope you found the discussion today helpful. On behalf of myself and the Probate Nation, thank you for visiting with us. Hi, Richard Ruddy, host of the Probate Nation television show on Channel 10. Just finished taping a very instructive discussion with my guest attorneys Peter DePaulis and Jack Burgess about dealing with personal injury and wrongful death claims in an estate. I invite you to watch that upcoming interview, but if you miss it, replays can be viewed on the Probate Nation website.